Hello and welcome to this session in which we are still working in chapter 14, which is the cost of capital. In this session, we looked at, in the previous session, we looked at the cost of equity and specifically using the dividend growth model. In this session, we're going to look at the cost of equity. However, we're going to be looking at the, the SML line, the security market line, which is something that we looked at in the prior chapter. So the what we concluded from the SML line is that the required or the expected rate of return on a risky investment, if it's a risky investment, depend on three things. What's the ongoing risk-free rate? What's the market premium? What's the market risk premium? For example, the market risk premium is uh, the expected return above the risk-free rate. So what's the expected uh, return over the risk-free rate? And the beta, which is the sy systematic risk of the asset relative to average, which is called beta. Okay, those are the three things. So, using the SML, we can rewrite the expected return on the company's common equity. The expected return, just like what we looked at the expected return in the prior chapter, is the risk-free rate. We're going to start with the risk-free rate, and we have to earn more than the risk-free rate. Then we're going to take the market premium, uh, uh, find the market premium, find the market premium, multiply it by beta and add it to the risk free rate. Okay? So the expected re return, so we're going to just kind of put R of E just to kind of be consistent with the other method, is the risk free rate plus beta times the risk premium, the risk premium. So let's go ahead and look at an example to see how this method works. Because example will illustrate it. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. Let's assume um, that the uh, market risk premium is 7%, okay? U.S. Treasury are paying about 0.9%, but well, it doesn't matter for now, but let's assume it's 7%, and the uh, Treasury will pay 0.1%, not 10%, not uh, point, uh, point 0.1%. So we will use this risk-free rate. So the risk-free rate is 0.1%. And we're going to use the market premium is uh, 7%. And the beta coefficient for for this company, which is Abercrombie and Fitch, which is publicly traded company, is 1.85. So let's find the required rate of return for Abercrombie and Fitch. So let's take a look at it. Risk-free rate is 0.1% plus, plus, plus the beta times the risk premium. Well, the beta is 1.85 and we said the risk premium for large companies like Abercrombie and Fitch, it's 7%. This is given. This is, so all the information is given. This is given, this is given, and this is given. So basically what we find out, the expected rate of return using the SML line is 13.05%. Therefore, we say the cost of equity because if the required rate of return, if the investors want to earn 13.05, the company is expected to return to them 13.05. So this is the using the SML approach to estimate the expected rate of return. So let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of this approach. Okay, for one thing, what's the advantage of it? Hopefully you already noticed. One of the advantages is it takes into account risk. Why? Because we're starting with the risk-free rate and moving upward. So when we calculate the risk premium, what we are saying is this is the uh, premium that's above the risk-free rate. So we're looking at risk. It's applicable to companies other than just with dividend growth. So remember, the dividend growth model only could be used for companies that pay dividend. The SML line, you don't have to be paying dividend. So we could still find your uh, expected rate of return although you don't pay any dividend, okay? Of course, there are drawbacks, disadvantages. Well, once we estimate it's a, anything, it, it's a disadvantage. The market risk premium and the beta coefficients, though, those are estimates. To the extent that our estimates are poor, the resulting cost of equity will be inaccurate. For example, our estimate for the risk premium is 7%, is based about on 100 years of returns on a particular stock portfolio and market was about... 88 years to be more specific. So using a different time period, you'll get a different risk premium. So it's 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 an estimate. And once you're dealing with estimate, you're dealing with the you're dealing with the unknown. Finally, as with the risk with the dividend growth model, we essentially rely on the past to predict the future. 
And is this always the case? That's not always the case. The past help us predict the future, but the future doesn't have to be reflective of what happened in the past. But it's a, it's a base that we can start from. Okay, economic conditions can change quickly. So as always, the past may not be a good guide to the future. In the best of all worlds, both approaches, the dividend growth model and the SML are applicable and the two results in, in similar answers. If this happened, we might have some confidence in our estimate. So what we can do, we could use both method and hopefully the results are similar. So let's take a look at an example if we use both method for a company and see what would happen and which one do we use. Okay. So suppose stock in alpha freight had a beta of 1.2, the market premium is 7% and the risk-free rate is 6 Alpha last dividend was 2% and the growth is 8% indefinitely. The stock currently sell for $30. So what is alpha cost of capital? Well, if we looked at the SML approach, we're going to take the risk-free rate, 6%, plus beta times the premium. Beta times the premium plus the 6% will give us under the SML, the, uh, under the SML, the cost of equity is 14.4% for alpha air freight. Now we could use the same thing and find the cost of equity using the dividend growth approach. The formula is D1, the future dividend divided by the current price plus G. Well, the future dividend, the company is paying right now $2 and it's gonna grow at 8%. So $2 times 1.08, it's gonna give us D1, D1 of $2.16. So we're gonna take $2.16 divided by the current price of $30 then add the growth rate of 8%, and that's going to give us 15.2%. So under the dividend growth model, the cost of capital is 15.2. Now the question is which, one is, which one should we use? Which one is more accurate? They're both estimates. So what do we do? Just go ahead and run the average. And the average is 14.8. So take 15.2 plus 14.4, divide by 2, and you're going to get 14.8. So the co an approximate cost of equity for this company is 14.8. So this is basically a way out just to be um, just to, to be on the safe side. If you have any questions, any comments, by all means, email me.